Okay, there was a time in America, maybe 50, 60 years ago, where we would celebrate, or at least the, the business class among us would celebrate, uh, most Americans didn't have much opinion on it other than that it made us richer, the fact that we were, the United Fruit was building canneries in Nicaragua and hiring Nicaraguans. We were investing in other countries so that we could bring the profits home. Stephen Moore is on the line with us, editorial board member, senior economics writer with the Wall Street Journal, WSJ.com. Stephen, welcome back to the program. Hey, Tom. Uh, stepping off from that point, you and uh, who co-authored this with you, David Melpass, David Melpass. Yeah. Uh, wrote this article, America's Troubling Investment Gap for the First Time in Decades, America's on Net Losing, Not Attracting Growth Capital. Why should we celebrate the fact that Germans are building factories here and taking the profits back to Germany, the Japanese are building factories here and taking the profits back to Japan, and Americans are not building factories here, but in fact are building factories in China and Vietnam and Malaysia and taking and, and I guess keeping the profits here, but actually they're not. They're keeping the profits overseas so they don't have to pay taxes here. Why should we celebrate any of that? Why shouldn't we go back to the way it was pre-Clinton and and you know have american companies make american goods in america for american consumers well because we we have in the past been been uh, big winners in the race for capital you know in the 80s and 90s when we had such strong uh economic growth one of the things that was an engine of that growth uh, tom was the fact that foreigners invested trillions of dollars in the united states and building factories here building manufacturing plants here headquarters here which created you know, literally millions of jobs for America. But, but those jobs could have been created by American companies. The reason that those foreigners were spending that money in the United States is because we were borrowing that money from them. Uh, it, because because we were buying. I mean, Actually, starting starting in the seventies when when oil. You know, when we passed the point where we were importing more oil than we were producing. You know, I think it was seventy two was that year. Um, we started buying oil like crazy. Our our. We went from being a nation that had had a trade surplus for 200 years to having a trade deficit for the first time. When you've got a trade deficit, people on the other side of that deficit, they're sitting there with a bunch of dollars. The only place they can spend them is here. So they come over here and they buy buildings or they build factories. But I don't get why we should celebrate the fact that you know part of America is being sold off to foreigners. Well, it's because, um, first of all, you've got the, rever the causality reversed here. What happened was when inflation came way down in the 1980s and tax rates came down, the United States became an incredibly attractive place to invest. That's why those tax cuts were so important. So foreigners wanted to invest in the United inflation States. Inflation had nothing to do with tax cuts, Stephen. You know that. That was, no, that was, that was Paul Volcker and then Alan Greenspan. No, no, no. I'm saying... Yeah, you had the Volcker-Reagan disinflation that happened in 1981, and then in 1982, and then you had the which tax was the result of the Volcker-Carter policies, yeah, actually. It was Reagan who was the one who Reagan uh, had who, nothing who, to do with it. It was Paul Volcker. No, it wasn't. It was Reagan was the president. Reagan was the one who, who basically gave the okay to to, uh, to Volcker to, to slam the brakes on the money supply. Almost every liberal, if you go back to that period, was opposed to that policy, and they thought we'd have 12 percent inflation throughout the decade. But my point is that once inflation came down and once tax rates came down, the United States became an extremely attractive place to invest. Foreigners needed dollars to invest here. How did they get dollars? Uh, they sold more goods to us than we sold to them. So the reason we had a trade deficit in the 80s and 90s was because foreigners wanted to invest in the United States. The problem... No, we had a trade deficit because we abandoned tariffs. We started this free trade nonsense. Richard Nixon started pushing this stuff. When we, at, and during his presidency, we had average tariffs in the United States of well over 20%. And by the time Reagan came into office, they were in the teens. You know, Clinton took them down to 2%, which is where they are now. We, we dropped our trade... Our, our protections of American industries that we'd had in place for over 200 years, and suddenly we have, a, we have a trade deficit. I don't understand why conservatives aren't concerned about this. I mean, this was stuff... This Herbert Hoover was all over this. Dwight Eisenhower was all well, over... Barry Goldwater was all over this. What has <laughs> happened to you guys? Yeah, that was what the article is about, is that nobody wants to invest in the United States anymore, neither Americans nor foreigners, because it's simply not an attractive place to invest in with the, you know, all of the new regulations. Because of the, the, because of the wreckage of 30 years of Reaganomics. Yeah, I'm with you. No, actually, in the 80s and 90s, we imported capital. It wasn't until the last couple we of years... We imported capital because we were exporting... Debt. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. 
We had it. We had a balance of trade deficit as a consequence of these policies that were championed by. by, And I'll be bipartisan about this. These policies were championed by Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, both George Bushes. And for the and for that matter, to this day, Barack Obama, we have not had a protectionist president in the no, White House sure. since Jack Kennedy. Since Herbert Hoover, actually. And well, Jack Kennedy was uh, big, you know, I'll give you that. Jack Kennedy was a total uh, free trader. But yeah, let, let I'll give you that. that. I'll give you that. Herbert Hoover was the last guy. Yeah, I mean, that didn't turn out so well. But well, it had nothing to do with the Great Depression. That had nothing to do with trade. The tariffs? The, you never heard of the smooth Smoot-Hawley tariff? That was the trigger for the Great Depression. Almost every academic agrees with that, that when, the, when we passed the smooth Ali tariff, that's when the smart stock market collapsed and the whole the global uh, trade system shut down. But Okay, hang on just is, a second, Stephen. Pause right yeah. there. Let me just lay a couple of facts on the table for I'll you. Who? Okay. The Great Depression, I think you agree, began in 1929 with the crash in October yep. 29? Yeah. Okay. smoot Hawley was passed on June 17, yeah. 1930. Yeah, but the next year. What? There's yeah, a great book on uh, the, GD, the way the world works. The by GD, Jude he goes through the whole chronology. I know Jude Wadinski, uh, the two Santa Claus theorem. But let me just yeah. lay some numbers on you. Here's yeah. just just net net exports of goods and services in 1929 when we had 103 billion dollar GDP, it was 0.4 percent of our economy. In 1930, when Smoot Hawley was passed, it became 0.3 percent of our economy. It was 0.1% in 31 and 32 and 33. It went back up to 0.3% in 1934, a negative two-tenths of 1% in 35, a negative one-tenth in 36. And, and by the way, Smoot-Hawley was repealed in 34. A negative, uh, a positive 0.1% in 1937. Smoot-Hawley had nothing to do with the Great Depression, number one. And number two, international trade was a meaningless part of the American economy in no, the 1930s. It was actually a pretty big part of the. It became meaningless in the 30s because the, what happened was the global trading system shut down. And so that's why we had a depression, not just in the United States, uh, but around the world. We our, don't want to pass another Smoot-Hawley. Our total world. exports in 1931 were $2.9 out of a 76 billion. Point five billion dollar economy. That's I'm looking at this. The system shut down. That's you're making my point that you didn't have any tr- exports or imports because of no. It was two point. When we passed Smoot Hawley. The rest of the country world retaliated with higher tariffs as well. So the the amount of goods and services that were after Smoot Hawley was repealed in, in 1934, a year after it was repealed, it was two point six percent, a two point six billion. It was two point nine billion in 1931 under Smoot Hawley. Well, uh, you look know, at the I'm, numbers. I'm it was 2.8 billion but... in 1935. I'm looking at the actual numbers from BEA.gov right here. Well, the... my gosh, if you're endorsing another Smoot-Hawley tariff, I, I mean, absolutely am. That, that does that frightens me because I think most sound economists would agree that Smoot-Hawley, if it wasn't the exact trigger, it's a fairy tale, totally Stephen. Exacerbated it's the, a fairy uh, tale. Discussion. It's a fairy tale. <laughs> it ain't a fairy tale. But look, we've got to start attracting jobs. And why is it a bad thing if Honda builds a plant in the United States? We had, we had from 1821 to 1900, the average tariff in the United States was 29.7 percent. It peaked in 1830 at 57.3 percent. This is twice what Smoot Hawley was. And yeah, during world, that period of time when we had that high tariff, we built the biggest industrial economy yeah, in the, the world. But the world was totally different in the 19th century than it, than yes, it was. Yes, we were protecting century. ourselves. No, I mean, look, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, we actually reduced tariffs, and we actually had... I know, and, it's, and look at what it's led us to. It's led us to an $800 billion annual trade jobs. deficit. It's led us to, to, to people like you uh, saying it's okay. wonderful that uh, Volkswagen is coming over here and building well, factories so they can yeah. take money back to Germany. Right. Well, if, look, if it's a bad thing, where do you want them to build the plant? Somewhere outside the United States? I want American companies making American goods in America for Americans so that we don't have to depend on foreigners to build well, our I want, factories. I, want factories built I don't want to be like Nicaragua was companies. in the 1950s. <laughs> but, but anyway, I, I, I think we've both made our points here. Stephen Moore, okay. editorial board member, uh, Wall Street Journal, WSJ.com. What's your last book, Steve? It's called uh, Return Stephen? to Prosperity. Return to Prosperity. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Stephen Moore, WSJ.com. We'll be back. This is the Tom Hartman Program. Smooth Hawley. I can't... You know, <laughs> we'll be back. 